when I was I was reading Michelle Wallace's uh, introduction to her new book, The Black Macho, and in that book she actually recants everything she says initially about the, the idea of the black macho, the idea that they have privilege, that they only fought for civil rights to sleep with white women, that it was the ultra, ultimate doom of the black power movement. And in that book she said that one of the things that we have to analyze is not only how black men, because they're denied the power of masculinity in society, may seek to imitate the idea of white men. And mind you, she says that this was just her theory. She said it had no journalistic history historical or sociological proof. She said there's also this aspect of the myth of the superwoman. And in this myth of the superwoman, there's an idea that certain black women who are bourgeois, who are middle class, aim to compete with black men and other men in the society to take the place of the white patriarch. And I think about this, and I think about the attacks that poor, uneducated, largely imprisoned black men and brown, young brown men suffer in this society. And I think that part of the problem of why we don't recognize their vulnerability is because there is a profit. There is a profit in the deniability of their suffering. There is a profit for us to not have to answer for the types of inequities that are produced by this democratic society. And there is a profit in producing the type of scholarship that says that you can never study this group. That this group, in fact, has to be condemned, not only in the sense that they're politically murdered and erased, but also in the sense that you can have no knowledge about what they concretely experience. And who does that benefit? I'd ask myself, who then does that benefit? Who does it benefit for young black men to only be in prison, to only be killed, to only be at the low, lowest rungs of society? And the question, the answer to that, of course, is white society, white people. But then when we get into this analysis about why white people are the ones that are in charge of society, we forget something that's very crucial. And that crucial point is how other black people, largely black middle class people, have always tried to assimilate to integrate and to perpetuate the types of ideas that this society gives them for profit. You know, one of one of the most popular segments I did on your show, Rob, was, uh, you know, white privilege is not profound, it's for profit. And, you know, people people enjoyed that because it attacked white people. And I think I was ultimately correct, but what we have not yet learned to do is to attack the types of interests and sentiments that black people internalize on the basis of white people. See, white privilege doesn't simply operate in the sense that white people are put on the world with certain checklists of things they have. It also operates in the sense that it creates psychologism. It creates a relative deprivation of sorts where black people who are aspiring to increase and to mobilize themselves through the classes see white people and think that their white privileges are the marks of success itself. So in doing that, in seeking to mobilize through these classes, they take on the ideas of white privilege, so much so that they will even condemn and buy into the anti-black stereotypes of their own people. So we see an academic and political discourse which insists on people more marginalizing the interests of certain groups of people, specifically young, black, criminalized men, so that they can participate in the types of ideologies that white people do under the guise of progressivism. 